So the final paper of this session, we have a video afterwards, but the final paper is actually a note by uh, Scott Davidoff and uh, some of my colleagues at Microsoft Research. I think this is based on an internship that Scott did uh, uh, in my lab. So I'm very excited to see it uh, being presented. Please go away. Uh, thanks, James. Um, I think I want to start by picking up a question that Gregory asked during the, uh, the sit down earlier, which is if he was to predict or to, for us to do what he most wanted in 10 years was to answer really hard questions in the world. So one of the questions is why, why aren't we doing that? And, and what makes this so hard? And I think one of the most important reasons is because we have to deal with existing infrastructure. So in other words, if, as I think many people here are, if you're interested in sustainability and you've had ideas about algorithms that might be able to um, help people maintain the appropriate temperature in their car or keep lights on and off. Well, you have to work with, for example, if you're looking at uh, temperature control, you have to deal with the climate control system in the house. And so if you actually want to implement a system that can uh, actually try and use some of the algorithms to change the temperature, I think you only have a few methods available. And in this work, I'm going to try and introduce a hacky new cheap method that I think can help get more systems out there earlier. So first, there's a fancy way. I think if you're interested in uh, doing work in climate control, you have a company, this is kind of hard to see, I apologize, uh, named Insteon, for example, who make uh, really uh, well robust systems that cost around a thousand dollars and they allow you to uh, effectively maintain a remote control of certain parts of a home. Um, and I think it's great but definitely very expensive and uh, works for only what Insteon is uh, able to work with. I think the second way is a hacky way. And this basically involves taking out uh, circuits and solder, and you end up with a uh, thermostat that looks like this. So if you wanted to go into most people's homes, I'm guessing that they would have second thoughts about this. So um, what I started to think about was a third approach that I'd like to call mechanical hijacking. And it's something that's actually been around for a long time. In fact, it's the same kind of technology that helps a player piano. And basically, what, we're sa what I'm trying to say is, any mechanical device that's designed for a human hand can easily be actuated by some kind of robot. And so, getting back to my example of climate control, instead of looking at the fancy system, we could just hijack the buttons mechanically. And what you see here are um, two little actuators that I've built using uh, Lego uh, Mindstorms. And they basically just push the button to make it hotter or colder. And then, of course, they have a built-in network interface. So if you want to make and test a really smart context-aware system, what the, I, I think one of the easier things to do is just stick some robots on the buttons. So I, I call this approach uh, robot pseudopods, um, or I call these uh, robot pseudopods. And essentially, it's any actuator that acts on the buttons just designed for a human hand. Now, I uh, worked with Lego Mindstorms, but I think any toolkit can easily suffice. Now, uh, for those of you not familiar with Lego Mindstorms, 
uh, in this picture here, the center is an intelligent brick. The bottom four uh, uh, cables connect to various sensors, and the top three to tiny motors. And those are the motors that I use to actuate the uh, various ways to hijack the mechanical interface. Now, you can have basically very simple primitives. So if you look at just the ability to poke, pinch, or twist, um, you can take over a lot of the infrastructure in the house. And so if you'd like to explore ways to save energy at home, well, when you look at this light switch, I mean, it seems like it would work really well with a poker. Or if you're interested in having the stove hot or making sure the stove's shut off, and then you can put a twister on it. Um, and as demonstrations, I built a variety of different uh, uh, robot pseudopods in a variety of environments. Um, not many people are talking about the climate control system in a car, but I just wanted to show how you might work with a knob, for example. But really, any mechanical switch, uh, anything that operates by a mechanical switch can be overridden. And so if you, for example, want to work with a Roomba, and send it around the house and have an intelligent little agent. Well, again, um, here's where you can use mechanical robot pseudopods to hijack the capabilities of the Roomba. So here I've put a layer on top that allows you to uh, fasten the uh, tiny little actuators. And what you can see are there's a pincher attached to each bumper. And so if you want to get the robot to go left, you just pinch the right bumper, and the robot thinks that it ran into the wall. And if, it, if you want it to go right, pinch the left bumper, it avoids right. Uh, it avoids the left and turns to the right. And then I've put a poker on the top to tell it to start and stop. Um, and I found that I wanted to test this, so I work with the first Lego League in Pittsburgh, and so I had access to two classes of at-risk middle school teenage girls, and I spent four hours with them, and I said, build a working Ubicomp prototype. And what they decided they wanted to do was to create a system that could actually watch television and turn the TV on for them connected to sound. And so what you can see here is the girls actually in this time, uh, in the bottom right of this image, uh, invented a different kind of poker that was actually able to use rotational motion to touch the on-off switch on the remote control. And the second group used a poker to directly turn the television on and off. And so basically you hear the two pokers have the ability to turn, move the channels up and down, and you have turned the uh, television on and off. And again, here's a view of the girls working, and they just basically used masking tape and the idea of why you figure out how to rewire a television remote control. Let's just poke the buttons with tiny little robots. Um, so I borrowed a whole lot of images, so I'm happy to... Uh, just share credit, and since this is a short talk, I'll have to leave the stage after and say if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. <coughs>